Hey everyone, welcome to this week's news and community spotlight. Want to get an early look at the latest version of UE4? Unreal Engine 424 is on the road to release and Freeview 1 is now available for download. Get it today to check out updates to pixel streaming and ray tracing, try out the Sky Atmosphere component, and test the new Auto SDK and Build Agent developer tools. Try out beta features such as the landscape blueprint brushes and the landmass plugin, updated material layers, and the OpenXR plugin. The 424 Preview 1 forum thread contains a complete list of updates, and we invite you to share feedback on this and subsequent releases there. Keep in mind that preview builds are not production ready, so if you're testing out the features, we encourage you to use copies of your projects. Have you grabbed this month's free marketplace content? If not, head over there now to snag this month's products, a ballistics FX pack, interactive lights, a mesh placement system, and aquatic environment pieces, plus a few construction and Hollywood set prop packs that will help add authenticity to your next project have been added to the permanent collection. Norwegian studio Rock Pocket Games made the jump from their successful, bright, colorful brawlers and platform puzzlers to something new. The moody and atmospheric Lovecraftian horror game Moons of Madness. Watch our spotlight to hear how the team worked to keep gamers on the edge of their seats as they step into the space boots of Shane Newhart, a technician spiraling into madness on the new frontier of Mars. With multiple projects across a number of platforms, Forcefield Entertainment is a studio that specializes in VR. Their first UE title, Landfall, launched on Oculus Rift in 2017, and since then they've gone on to build many different experiences using Unreal for a wide variety of VR platforms. The team has kindly put together a detailed guide on how they optimize their environments to let key elements shine up close without compromising their workflow. Make sure to check it out if your next project is in VR. Two-person team Flight School Studio released their genre-mashing pinball brawler Creature in the Well to much-deserved high praise. Dive into our interview with them to find out how they delivered the surprise hit as a small team, including notes on melding distinct gameplay mechanics and their unique comic book-inspired aesthetics. And don't forget that the 2019 Epic Mega Jam starts next week, and it's the five-year jam anniversary of UE4 Jams. This is your chance to compete in our biggest jam yet, featuring a GDC 2020 grand prize package from Intel, custom Mega Jam branded PCs from Falcon Northwest, and much more. We'll announce the theme on the November 14th live stream. Get all the details and sign up on the official itch.io Mega Jam page. All right, here are this week's top karma earners. Every Nun, D Demon, GeoDVS, Blue Mind Studio, Trigger, Cheerer, Unearthly Whales, Bojan Novakovic, M. Jansons, and T. Sumisaki. Thank you all so much for helping out others on Answer Hub. Over to our spotlights, first up is a beautiful interactive architectural demo created by FlexImage. What you see is all built by their team and imported into Unreal via Datasmith. You can download the application and try it out for yourself via their website. Here is Guntastic. Sit on your couch or take this 16-bit party brawler online to battle in lightning-fast one-shot, one-kill rounds. Participation is heavily encouraged because after each round, anyone still alive is forcibly eliminated. Wishlist it now on Steam. And the final piece this week is Dawn of an Old Age, blending a beautiful live dance performance with interactive visuals. Projected onto both the dancer and the wall, the visuals leverage motion tracking to influence the particles and graphics on screen. Get additional details and watch their full video available in our forums. All right, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Unreal Engine live stream. I'm your host, Victor Bowden, and with me today, I have technical writer Tim Hobson. That is correct. Thanks for being back. <laughs> Gladly. Yeah, always having a good time <laughs> when you're around. Um, today, we're going to talk about a bit about workflow enhancements and mm -hmm. sort of a few ways some have existed for a while and some are new in 424 yep. of how you can improve productivity. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of settings that are just kind of like, you know, like new and experienced users may not know about. Um, that you know, we'll just kind of or as a little refresher, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a refresher, absolutely. So, 
Cool. Yeah. Let's let's dive into the editor. Oh, okay. I guess I got to do something, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I can sit there and ask you questions about <laughs> what you had for breakfast and s some other interesting. But I think most of them are here to watch um, watch a little bit of what we can do in the editor. Okay. So. Um, uh, I, I guess the first thing we're going to start off with is a little bit more of an interesting thing for some newer users. Um, so I wanted to start out with the project setup and just kind of like uh, project setting stuff. So we're going to dive in there. And then we're going to kind of bounce around. Um, but we're going to kind of focus on uh, you know project setup, editor setup, um, some level editing stuff, and then we'll kind of bounce around a little bit. So Yeah, a little um, editor utility widget. Yeah, yeah. So All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is go up here to the edit um, and project settings, and then I'm just going to dock this up here because we're going to come back to it a number of times. Um, but here on the project settings, uh, there's a couple of defaults. So if you're a new user or anything, um, you have things in here where you can actually uh, set your project thumbnail if it's something that you want to do, if you have you know finalized art or something that you want uh, to have that icon for um, when you look at it in the Epic Launcher. Um, we also have some description stuff. Uh, and then the other one here, that uh, the maps and modes. This is a really useful one. Um, you'll notice any time that you open up the editor, it's always going to uh, the default starter map or, mm -hmm. or whatever. So you can actually set a startup map, and you can set a game default starter map. So like whenever you do standalone games and stuff like that, you can, uh, you can be working on whatever level it is. But if you want to start on like your main menu for your game, um, you can have it default to starting with that. So, And that's good in case if sort of it's an open world game. Right. And probably every time you open and, and you start the editor, you don't want to have to load that entire thing, because mm -hmm. um, maybe you're just iterating on something else, right? Um, and that's when it's good. Maybe you can just have a blank map. That's a startup map. That's usually mm -hmm. what I do. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. So I mean, there's, there's a couple of different workflows, but these are some things that we, we tend to start with. Um, same for default game mode. So it's like once you kind of get those in place, um, if you want to move beyond just our, our standard default template stuff that we have. Um, and then let's jump down here to the rendering settings. Um, I tend to default to disabling a couple of them um, for my normal editor workflow. So if we come down to rendering here and then we scroll down to the very bottom, we have some post-processing defaults here. Um, one that tends to, uh, that I tend to disable when I'm working in the editor is auto exposure. And this is, uh, you know, if you ever go from a bright scene to a dark scene, and or you have a bright light source, and you're looking at that, and you look away, it, it takes that second for that that history to kind of, you know, clear, and it's like, you know, and, and levels out um, in the scene. So I, I tend to disable this one typically all the time. Uh, one thing you should know about that is, so that would disable it here while working in the editor, but if I were to hit G and go to game mode, that does not disable it there. So you would still have those defaults um, that are applied for your game while you're playing or, or, or checking things out in the editor. OK. Um, so it's not going to be something that you have to constantly go back. Um, but it's, it's a good workflow thing that I use. Um, let's see here. And then the other one I'm going to jump over to is, let's see here. Uh, we have editor, or was that editor preferences? I'm sorry. Uh, if we go to edit, editor preferences. Um, we have a whole bunch of other settings here. Oh, actually, let me go back to project settings and just kind of clear up a couple things here as well. Um, so with project settings, um, we do have these two areas like where you can set preferences and settings. Um, the project settings are going to be for your specific project that you're working on. So anything that we change in here is only going to be a per project basis. Um, whereas when we come over to editor preferences, anything that we set here is going to be on the engine level. So. Any of these settings here are going to apply to any of the editor um, or any engine version that I create, and or, or sorry, any project that I create going forward. Mm -hmm. These editor preferences are going to carry over. Um, so some of the keyboard shortcuts that we have for for doing the previews in the scene and stuff like that um, are going to carry over. So if you added those when you do a yeah, new project, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, but the the next thing, uh, so in the editor preferences, we have a lot more. Since these are more around the editor and how you're using it, um, there's a lot more accessibility things in here. Um, like we understand that you know there there are people that have color blindness kind of things going on, or or you may just have a different setup for how you want to color uh, you know selections or anything in the levels. Um, so we have a bunch of settings in here for our user interface that we you can change the. Uh, um, yeah, I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but uh, there's, <laughs> <'cause Funny. laughs> there are literally hundreds of them. Um, but the uh, the accessibility ones are really kind of uh, cool here. Um, so you can actually switch to you know whatever type of uh, color deficiency that you mm -hmm. do have. Um, 
you know, and depending on the severity of that, you can actually increase or decrease that. Um, if you're still having, you know, issues where it doesn't quite meet your needs, uh, we do also have the color selections here, and then um, you can also change some of the other settings around as well uh, for, like, the output log and, you know, just anything that does have colors, yeah. you know, for it. So. Um, Sorry, uh, forgive me a little bit because I have to go back and forth between a list because it's a lot to try and remember. So. <laughs> and it's not in a very linear flow. So, <laughs> um, The next one is for graphs. Um, so this one's kind of cool. It's like I've seen people, like they, they don't like having the graph, uh, the, the grids behind um, their, uh, their editors for um, like blueprint and material editors. So disabling that now when oh, I go. Oh, I've never to, seen this. Now when I go and. There we go. Open level blueprint. You now, it's you now get that nice clean. You know, if you if, if you absolutely hate grid lines mm -hmm. and being able to, yeah, um, the snapping still works, so that's that's not gone away. But but that's one thing too. So yeah, I'll just drag this here because I'm sure I'll come back to blueprints at some point. Um, and you can also adjust the uh, the the grid snap size too. Um, let's see here. And then let's just come back over here to keyboard shortcuts. If you're, um, like we do have a lot of keyboard shortcuts in the editor and we're, we have them to, um, all over the place uh, for different editors and different things that you can do. So for instance, like the blueprint editor here, um, we have a bunch of uh, console, or not console commands, but uh, hotkeys that you can, you can use these. Um, if you're not familiar with any of them, uh, you know, these, this is somewhere that you can come and you can actually look and if you're just, you know, it's like I absolutely hate this one key command. You can actually set your own right here, um, or set up a whole slew of new ones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you'll you'll notice there's actually a lot of ones in here for like uh, you know like show floor, you know uh, show grid, you know these uh like so that thing we just did we can actually set up a toggle for that if we wanted mm -hmm. um, while working in Blueprint. So, um, but yeah, there's there's a whole lot of options you'll see throughout here. Um, uh, so I just encourage everyone just to kind of dive through and just find you know what works for you. Um, so the next thing, uh, this is another one that too is like um, the save frequency that comes up. Uh, so it's under general, and then loading and saving, that right here. Um, we do have an option in here. So the you'll get this little toast pop up in the top uh, in the bottom right down here. You should probably see it in. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe we just didn't see yeah. That. So, so right now it's set to save every ten minutes, um, and then there's an interaction delay of like uh, the fifteen seconds, and then it gives you a warning of that ten seconds where it pops up and before it's going to save. Um, you know, if you find that you know instead of just fully disabling this, uh, I, I do always encourage everyone to keep the auto save on. You just might want to extend, or you know, if you're a little bit more paranoid, probably decrease mm -hmm. it a little bit, and you know. Um, because uh, you know, depending on the number of assets, how large the level is, the number of changes you made, you may have more to save, so it can take longer. So um, it may make sense not to up interrupt your workflow every ten minutes with this. Um, this is another one that I like, and I've used on a number of occasions. Um, it was it's called the uh, show frame rate and memory usage, and I didn't write where it, where it was, so we're we just going to search for it. But yeah. But the one thing about all of this is we have the all settings. We added this a number of releases back. Um, but no matter which one I'm in, too, it's like uh, if I type show uh, what frame rate, uh, oh. um, it's going to show up uh, regardless. Uh, so when I enable this one, I go back to my editor, and now get the frame rate up here, I get the uh, um, and the uh, the memory usage for this level that's actually happening. Okay, so it is for whatever's being rendered inside the viewport. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm trying to dip it. Yeah, I'm trying to dip yeah. it. But it's like maxing out at like that 120. Uh, T. Sorry, I'm just gonna max FPS. Yeah. All right. Okay, so yeah, we limited a little bit. Yeah, doesn't help like when you're in like an optimized scene, you know, for yep. a sample, <laughs> like trying to mess with it. Um, but yeah, you can totally control all that right there. Um, but the, the memory usage is a really good one, I think. Um, you know, just uh, you know, especially if you start to get driver crashes or something like that. You yeah, know, you, you can probably try and keep an eye on something. So. What I like about it is that it's not um, clobbering up your the viewport. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, so the other option here um, that most other people do is the show FPS, um, which you can also enable with the console command. Show, hold on, what is it? Did I just like totally forget it? Stat, uh, FPS. stat FPS, there we go. Um, which does the same thing, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you have these toggles here in the level viewport. Um, so that's just one way to keep your, your viewport a little less cluttered if if you're focused on that, um, there's some other console commands for like stat unit that has some useful information mm -hmm. too um, for debugging. And the graphs. And right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's just another little hidden gem just kind of away. Um, so editor preferences, we'll come back here. Um, another one, this one's enabled by default, but uh, um, in case someone ever disables it for you, you should probably know about it. Um, the use less uh, CPU when in the background. So if I minimize the editor, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we. We've kept this on enabled for a long, long time, um, but it's uh, it, it's an option that if, if you're you're thinking or suspecting that something's running in the background, go ahead and check and make sure this is actually enabled for your project and okay. it wasn't accidentally disabled. Um, and then there's another toast pop up that happens um, for enable editor monitor. Should I uh, mention because uh, someone in chat said that they mm -hmm. couldn't find show frame rate? Uh, does that exist in older editor right. versions as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've okay. used this since like four dot something. Okay, so it's not <laughs> like, like early on version. So it's not new. We're in um, uh, preview one uh, for four twenty four right now. Yeah, show frame rate and memory. Um, oh yeah, I should point out where that's actually located. So if you come here to general, um, was it performance, right here, and then under editor performance, you can find the toggle. And then there's a uh, there's a couple other ones in here. Actually, the next one I want to talk about is right here as well. So the the monitor editor performance. Um, this is something that doesn't automatically change your editor performance or anything like that, but it gives you the warning, gives you the option to uh, scale it down. So, for instance, like you were talking about the FPS dipping. Mm -hmm. um, so, if we're ever working in the editor and we see the FPS is starting to drop or whatever, um, the editor monitors that and it goes, "Hey, you know, it's like I see, you know, you got some stuff going on. Do you want to, you know, scale down the scalability settings so that way everything renders a lot smoother and you okay. can work in the editor, um, so you're not getting that sluggish frame rate." Um, and if you say yes, what will happen is under settings here in the toggle, or in the, the main toolbar, under scalability, it will adjust these between low, medium, high, epic, and you know, I don't think it automatically ever goes to cinematic, but, um, but the, uh, the four here, and it will it'll automatically switch between certain ones. So it's like you can actually, like for instance, if I'm working in the editor and it's like, I know I don't really care about shadows right now, and it's like I know it's a big cost for me, mm -hmm. but it's like I want to see some of the other effects that I've got. I can actually disable that or, or put it on low and then continually work in the editor and look at everything else at a higher quality. I mean, I don't suspect that's most people's workflow, but it's an option there if you want it. Yes. So, you know what? I completely forgot to grab at my desk the uh, the keep calm and look for the checkbox. Oh. oh that, is, that is a And I mentioned that heart. last week, too. I know. Yeah. I should have given it to you right then. <laughs> so you can just imagine the... Yeah. Yeah, we were supposed to have a little nice. Oh, man. It sits at your desk, right? It, it yeah, keep calm and look for the checkbox. It, it has sat there for five years now. Um, Eric Ketchum made it for me because he made it when we were on support. Um, yeah. But maybe next time? Yeah, maybe, yeah definitely yeah. next time. <laughs> yeah, because. All right. So, uh, all right, let's get out of these menus a little bit um, and start looking at some of the level editing stuff. So, um, some of the uh, viewport controls. Actually, I lied. I'm going to go right back to the editor preferences. <laughs> um, so if I come here to editor preferences and then level editor, and then I come down here to viewports, um, under controls here, there's a lot of options for however you like to work. So, um, so for instance, uh, let's see here. Um, for you people that like to work inverted on the y-axis, there you go. Checkbox. Have had it. Um, the in invert mouse y. Um, my wife would love those kind of settings. Like she's totally like an invert like okay. type person. Um, same for mouse sensitive sensitivity. Um, the uh, uh, some of these ones for the um, flight control cameras are kind of cool. If you have that kind of workflow, like uh, right now, it's like uh, for flying around and the editor is like you right click on the the mouse button and then use the WASD keys mm -hmm. to fly around. If you just don't want to have to always press that, that right mouse button, 
Um, you can totally just use the WASD keys. I think uh, um, GamePad works by default. GamePad does work by default. Yeah, yeah. which is really neat. I, yeah, I always have my Xbox One hooked up, so yeah. it's like when I do have to fly around some of the levels. Um, it's really kind of uh, a quick way to do it. Um, but, uh, let's see here. Uh, same with the, the foliage editor controls. Again, we have some drop downs here for, for placing those and, and depending on uh, different people's th types of workflow. Um, another one here uh, that's kind of cool that I was recently uh, rediscovered is the enable, combine, translate, and rotate widget. So what that one does when it's enabled is, let me find an asset and I'll just drag in here. So when I drag this, I'll let me go out of game view. Oh, do I have no collision on that floor? Yeah, there we go. So, so what you get with this one is you get this uh, this nice little translate and circle option, and I can just stay in this this movement of grabbing the translate widget. So I can just move everything around where I want. But if I now highlight over the the, the circle that's here, um, around part of it anyway. I'm not grabbing it like I did a second ago. No. <laughs> oh, there we go, the arrow on it. I'm sorry. I don't use it very often, but <laughs> like I said, I recently rediscovered it. But I can grab that arrow and I can do quick rotate. So for your level designers, um, this can be something where you can drag something in real quick. Um, let's do this guy. Grab the yellow circle and I can move it where I want. And you can see this little blue arrow right here. And then I can just completely just kind of rotate it and face the direction I want. Um, again, that one was the uh, look and feel, the combine, translate, and rotate widget. That one's been in for a long time. Um, and again, there's some there's some other ones for like the arc roll, rotate. Uh, I think that one's one we introduced last release. Um, oh, go ahead. They were wondering if it's possible to save the project settings uh, as default for all of your projects. Um, you can export them and then re-import them for your projects. Okay. Yeah. Um, so whenever you go to export. Um, you can save the INI file for that, and then just uh, now I don't know oh, that one's just saying crypto. I don't do this very often, so mm -hmm. well, really. So ever, it is possible. Obviously, let me try the yeah because we have an export for each one, so I imagine it's only the ones that you really need to focus on. So if you change a lot, like in whatever your project description or whatever else, I'm just speculating on some of that because I don't like I said I don't really do that. <laughs> I don't I don't want to speculate too much. Um, and then let's, uh, so let's come back here again for the look and the fill. There's a um, actually is it under that one. Actually, yeah, I know it's called background drop. So background drop distance, and this one's located in level editor viewports, um, look and fill, and then. So level editor viewports. Let me clear that and actually navigate to where it's at. Look and fill. Oh yeah, the advanced options. Ah. Um, background drop distance. So right now we have it at like a. Um, what this does is there's a sphere around where your your position is in the world. And when you go to drag, you may have noticed this. Like if you have nothing for it to land on, it's just it looks like it's far away. And then wherever you move it, it's just kind of just kind of out there in the world, right? Um, so. For instance, let me come out here, and I drag this sucker in, and you can see he's like right there, right? Somewhere on the other side of that, whatever, I guess. <laughs> Looks like he snapped to yeah. that. Sky sphere? Or? Yeah. It's, no? Oh, that's those, uh, there's like some planes mm -hmm. that kind of sit around that. But let me come out here. But there's a, there's a specified distance at 768 units. That it, yeah, because that's not snapped to anything. Shouldn't be, or is that? <laughs> <laughs> that's the skyscraper, isn't it? It is. There are more planes. Like, yeah, I know, right? Okay, so here we go. I'm beyond like anything it can snap to. Okay. You can see that, like right here, it's just like there's like it looks like it's a little bit closer, but it's just like that sphere of 768 units that's away from me. Um, that's what that edits. So it's like if you have a larger open world and you're wanting to drag something further away. Um, potentially, or you just don't like that it's 768 units. Um, you can actually increase this, decrease it. So 
Like if I just go down 250, I think it's gonna be slapped like right on my face. So it's like, again, it's like mm -hmm. right there in front of me. So that's an option um, as well. You know, these are just kind of like hidden little things. Uh, um, another one, this one I use actually quite often. Let me get back to the, the real world over here. Oh, there's the basement. <laughs> That's where Victor's office is. <laughs> it might be dark <laughs> like that. Um, That's because we won't, we like it dark. Okay, so <laughs> yes. Um, so if we take cameras here, um, and when you drag them into the world, you get this whole preview camera. So, and you'll notice this is really small here. Um, Or really depend, depend, depending on your DPI scale, which has been scaled up for this for the stream. But what you can do is under the editor preferences that look and feel again, we have the camera preview size. And I'm just going to minimize this because it does it in real time. You know, I love this because I didn't know about this feature either. Oh, you didn't either? And I have, um, I've disabled it entirely oh, when I actually <laughs> could have just shrunk it down. <laughs> um, so if we come back down here. Working in a smaller window. Oh, there we go. That five. So now I can actually, depending on whatever you're, you're you want, you know, if you want it smaller or larger, um, you can you can increase that size. So, so it's because I, I I tend to use it a lot for um, for things like when I'm doing camera placement or whatever, and I don't always want to pilot the camera. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a real quick way, so that way I don't have to like squint my eyes, get right up on my monitor and look at every pixel. You know, I can actually kind of see something really quickly um, this way. And you know, with the new settings here too, it's like we also get some of the, especially with the Cine camera, um, you get these uh, some of the digital presets that are already here. Um, so and scaling that up actually gives me that full view of it instead of it just kind of you know shrinking off screen. Um, so. And a nice workflow there, if you want to be able to sort of quickly see the camera's perspective um, and you make it basically your entire viewport, you can just use the world outliner to deselect it, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, yep. And I'm going to come back to some selection stuff in a second. OK. Because yeah, it's, in, it's in my long list of things over here that we're going to try a long list. Cover. Yeah. <laughs> There's probably uh, 10 times more to cover. If oh, yeah. yeah. We could totally do another stream on this. I won't, but we can <laughs> if you ask. Um, OK, so for the world outliner while working here, um, and then we'll come back over here. Uh, so we'll keep things on level editing. Um, one thing I actually, I, I knew I could do this in Content Browser. I never tried it in the world outliner. But for instance, I can use, uh, if I want to search for a couple of different things, I can use uh, type in like fog, and then I can do the pipe, and then let's just say directional light. And I get both those. I get anything that has fog in the title, and then I also get the directional light that I'm looking okay. for. So that's really neat because I, I do find that in my normal workflow, just with setting up a lot of stuff, um, you know, it's like I, I tend to want to switch back and forth between panels mm -hmm. quite often, um, and I I use the world outliner a lot to search, and but sometimes I'm I'm constantly having to go up there and type over and over again, you know, for the same three different things that I want in the world. Yeah. Um, if I have a long list of like for a scene like this, there's a lot of a lot of static meshes that I don't necessarily care about, but. Um, this is a good way to kind of have some of those. Um, I did open up the documentation because we do have, I want to show that we do have an advanced search syntax um, page. And this is all for the content browser as well. So um, you can find a lot of things through the content browser. We have examples set up here, the, uh, the operands that you should use. Um, and, and you can search not just by name, you can search by asset type and things like that. Okay. So you don't have to use just filters, you can actually scale it down a lot more. Um, you're very more granular, and um, a lot of the settings that are contained, like if you ever hover over a static mesh, um, yeah, I'll show you real quick. I have to re-enable something because for these streams, I do slate enable tooltips. Um, I disable those because what we get otherwise is we get a lot of this information and just have pop-ups that are constantly happening. Mm -hmm. um, but you can start searching some of this stuff using those operands. Um, so it does give you more, like if you wanted to see what poly counts are and stuff like that, you can actually get that granular with it and, and find those assets that are really high poly or something like that. So, huh. um, yeah, it's, it's really kind of cool, cool yeah. stuff that uh, that Jamie Dell added. So um, 
Thanks, and Jamie. Yes. So really, really kind of nice. And then I'm just going to disable that again. So I don't. If you don't like uh, the the uh, you know tooltip stuff popping up all the time, or if you're working content browser, that's another thing too. So um, this was not one I intended to show, but it's uh, slate dot enable tooltips zero. So um, again, and part of my normal workflow, just yeah. because <laughs> um, you know I'm, I'm typically grabbing a lot of screenshots for documentation and things like that. So I don't necessarily need to worry about uh, tooltips showing up in mm -hmm. there, especially when I start to move the mouse and hover over things. So Tim knows everything. No, he I doesn't don't. need tooltips. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. I absolutely do. <laughs> yeah, I found it useful to see uh, the native uh, parent class mm -hmm. of the object. Yes. Um, that's what I like to use them for. Um, so. Okay, so the next thing, um, let's run through a couple of, uh, I think this scene actually works kind of well for it because we got some translucent objects. So there's a couple of key commands that you can use while you're editing as well. So one that I use often too is like, I don't always want to have to go into, um, you know, plain editor or pi um, using uh, so we have over here with play um, you know I, I don't want to necessarily have to simulate the scene or you know or, or pi um, to get that game look for mm -hmm. something because like, it's typically going to go back to where my player start is and it's going to reset some things um, so hitting the G key switches over to game view um, I, I talked about this a little bit earlier when we were talking about disabling some of those post process things um, but what GameView does is it, it gives me essentially the look of the game um, or, or, or the viewport as if I'm playing the game in, in right. the editor. So uh, it, it it won't start any blueprint interactions or anything like that, but it gives me that, that final like rendered look. So um, it's a really clean way for me to kind of work with things without having to jump around a lot. Um, the one thing there too, if you like using that workflow, is when we go to show, and then um, under some of the show flags here, those post-process settings that I was talking about disabling in the um, project settings for just your normal editor workflow, these are not reset here. So if I set them here while I'm in game view, like for instance, let's just say I don't care about bloom. Um, that field's not gonna do anything on here. Um, I want something that's very, like tone mapper, mm -hmm. there we go. Disable that one because that's a definitive look. Like when I switch back, you'll see those things kind of turn back on. Um, I've got the bloom again, and that tone mapper is turned back on. So if I toggle between the two, they're going to be separate in that sense. So I can come back and I can toggle those back on again. Um, but again, you know, like this is typically what I do for while working with um, eye adaptation, like disabled in the editor. When I switch to game view, it gives me that final look. Um, you know, it's like a we have some things like when we're working more physically based as like and, and more physically accurate values for lighting, um, the the auto exposure becomes very important right. for some of those. So, um, this year, uh, another one is the T key. Uh, T is in Tim. So, um, I have here. Well, this project here has you know I did not make it. Um, we have these uh, uh, these fog planes here that are, you know, it's like, let's just say I'm trying to select something in the background. I keep selecting these these translucent fog planes. You know, I'm tired of selecting these. I want to yeah. select right through them because I can see through them. If you hit the T key, we're going to toggle, and it'll go to whatever. It, it, it will not select translucent objects. So that's a good, quick way to kind of um, toggle translucency. Does that include something that's masked as well? I don't know. Huh. I didn't try it. I typically have more trouble with, like, like fog planes. Yeah, usually um, I don't yeah, think it, or I don't think I don't think it would be a, a masked okay. object. Okay, but I've not tried like clicking. Like I don't know how much of like a masked area. Um, you know what? We could try. I think the yeah, trees. Yeah, we're are, additive, right? The, the trees are. Well, uh, it's got multiple materials, and yeah, I don't know. I'd have to. You know what? Let's just do it real quick. Figure this out. Let's just live. let's just do it real yeah, quick. Yeah, I mean, additive materials pretty quick, and then we can. Have a definitive answer. I don't think that floor has any collision because I think I accidentally deleted it because everything <laughs> keeps going through it. And I'm like, why? Um, that that is one thing to kind of note too. Um, if your floor doesn't have any collision, you know, they, we show you know it, it going off to that far distance for snapping to things. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't have collision, it doesn't know it can hit that that next, and that's going to be the next key can uh, key thing I show in a second. So, um, but uh, let's see leaves. Is there a quick way to see if the T button toggle is currently active? Active. I don't think what so. 
Oh, if huh. you have... Um, I don't know everything, people. No, no, <laughs> but, but we'll ask questions and we'll talk about it and then we can try to figure it out as yeah. well. Um, they're wondering if, the, if there's a way to see if selecting translucent objects are active. Like I think I, I usually just What do you keep, mean by active? Um, if it's possible to click through them or if you can oh, actually okay. select them in the viewport. Oh, yeah, I'm not um, sure. I think I, I usually just keep clicking T until I can select what I want yeah, to. Yeah, usually like my workflow is like, like if I am working in a scene and I'm trying to select something translucent and I, I can't, that, that's just, I, I don't even think about it now. I just hit the T key mm -hmm. and then just, oh, there we go. Um, that's just become part of my, my thing. Uh, it's like I'm not sure to see, which, uh, see if it shows like a toggled state. Um, but let's see here, materials. I know there's the leaves masked material thing in here, right? Are they in starter content or are they in the blueprints project yeah. assets? Because I don't I think don't that know. tree is part of well, that. Yeah, I thought there was like a you know the 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 prop bush kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, which actually, yeah, it's right there. So that's a masked material. Right. So T, I can select that, I can select that. T off, I can select through that, and I can select that. So okay. masked material does not toggle the translation. All right. There we go. Figured it out. There you go. That's that's <laughs> <laughs> real time thinking right there, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, another one. Um, so another key that's really kind of useful like for you level editors and just people placing things. Um, so when you drag something into the level, um, hit the end key on your keyboard, and it'll find the next uh, surface down under it, um, as long as it has collision. So I think this floor over here does not have collision. So, And for that copy, real quick, I just did a, a held alt and then drag. And so. Put that above surface, hit end, bye. and it went bye bye down to the next surface somewhere in the depths of that Victor's basement. Office. Yes. <laughs> um, now, one thing to note there is if it doesn't have any collidable surface below it, it won't move at all. It'll just stay in that one spot. Okay. So, but it's just going to go down to the next surface that it finds. Or I think if it's already overlapping with something. Right. Yeah. If it's so, yeah, if it's overlapping with something, that's not going to go anywhere. Um, because it's essentially has it's in some kind of collision at that point. Mm -hmm. So like there, end, and nothing's happening. Um, so we did game view spacebar. Spacebar is another one I like too. Um, and actually, I'm gonna come back over here because I want to make sure that I don't keep this thing enabled. The uh, I like it, but. You know, just for the stream, it's throwing me off a little bit right now. The uh, I disabled that combined rotate widget and translate. So now we're back in our normal stuff. And uh, one way to quickly toggle between our translate, our rotate, and our scale is hitting the space bar. Um, so you can just quickly just toggle those. And then you can also, up here we have the, the world space versus object space. Um, so that can be helpful. Like if I want to move an object in a certain way, I'm using object space right now, and the the rotate wid or the uh, translate widget, I can move the direction that the Z is for that one. Mm -hmm. um, versus if I go back to world space, uh, that Z is always up. So just another kind of quick little things. Um, and I'm gonna do this one with the cine camera because piling actors is not something I use it for very often. But let's. Find just the camera. Actually, you know what? I'm not even going to use. I'm not even going to drag it in. I'm just going to do this really awesome thing that All we right. have here for the drop down. We have uh, the create camera here, and I just want to thank Austin when he added the cine camera here because that made it made life much easier for me because I think I was doing the depth of field documentation at the time. Oh. Um, and I was constantly trying to create cameras for these shots, uh -huh. and I'd always have have to drag in that and place one of the other cameras and then re replace them. So, but um, so. One of the things is, is uh, let me get out of game view here, and I go back and I can see my camera. I've got it lined up for wherever I want, right? Um, and I'm just going to reset the rotations and stuff too. So, oh, oh yeah, this is that arc ball thing that I enabled earlier. Huh. I didn't actually show it. Um, you can grab the, uh, the little light sphere that you can see here, and you can just kind of like free rotate thing. Huh. Um, I'm probably making it look really, really. <laughs> 
Okay, so let me rotate that around. Um, but I can come over here and I can go to uh, perspective, and then what you'll see is I've got my cameras here. Um, I can choose whatever camera I want to pilot, and then when it goes into this pilot mode, um, I can just free fly that around the, the world and get it placed wherever I want. Um, so this is how I create a lot of the shots that I do for, for any of my rendering documentation, is I'll, I'll usually pilot the camera, get a really nice shot that I want, um, adjust some of the settings. That's, that's the beauty of it too, is over here in the details panel, it gives me all the settings while I'm in this mode. Um, I mean, obviously I can, I can select other things um, in the viewport while I'm piloting as well and, and have those. Um, but it, uh, it enables me to be able to work this way and then if I wanna, if I'm done with piloting, and let's just say I'm, I'm not done with piloting that, but it's like I just don't want to see that perspective. Um, what I can do is I can eject. Oh, I didn't eject. I, uh, I just disabled. Uh, so the the option here for the the camera view versus the game view. Um, this is what I was getting at with the settings. Uh, so if I go and adjust my settings. Um, Let's just, not that camera, uh, that camera. Um, you can see that I can adjust the settings here and I'm changing the, the focal length on this right now, I think. Can't see what that one is, yeah, focal length. And then if I disable, it gets rid of that cinematic view. Um, well, that part didn't change, but the, the depth of field stuff would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like it would, it would show the game view versus the editor view. Okay. Um, I can also eject, keep that camera there where it's at. Um, the Ejection process allows me just to get out of that camera. It stays there wherever it is, um, and it's kind of in that position until I choose to move it again. Um, if I want to go back and, and use the placed camera, oh, like, okay. I can go back to that that piloting mode. You can do this with any actor um, as well. Uh, so the cameras automatically show up here in our placed cameras, so that way we can um, you can jump to them. Um, if I want to pilot an actor, let me find a sphere. Right click. It might actually be further up in the menu there. Yeah, I think this it's. Ah, th uh, this is the thing you ran into, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was. It's it's off the screen. I can't see it. The option is there. Yeah, there's um. Yeah, just yeah. called pilot, right? Yeah, because this menu should be higher. Um, yeah, and it's it's just pilot, so it would be the you know this came kind of same thing, and then you would have the the camera perspective. So whenever you, because I can't do it right now, I'm just gonna have to tell you. But whenever you do it, um like for instance like the sphere here um i would be inside the object so there's not a two-sided material on this mm -hmm. so i'll be able to see through but let's just say if it was a two-sided material or if i'm going to pilot that tree over there and it's like i want to be able to you know plant my trees around or whatever um i'm going to have all that geometries in my way mm -hmm. um so uh was it hitting the g key should disable that so you can just see the view of the world okay. while you're piloting um because I can't do it, that's, that's going to frustrate me. But um, that, that should be all you need to do to, to do that. Uh, let's see here. Let's go back to some of the other ones. Um, another one, too. Um, let's look at some of the other view modes. So um, if we come to perspective, we have some of our top view modes and our different, different views. So it's like, let me go to top here. And in any of our orthographic views, we can do a middle mouse button and drag. And you can do a quick measure. Um, to see in units. Uh, so you eat four defaults to centimeters um, or 10 centimeters uh, per snappable unit mm -hmm. kind of thing. And that's what the, what we've got here. Um, so you can drag that out and kind of see what distances are between different things if you need. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to start going through these a little quicker. I am slow today. Are we? we <laughs> technically, I have another 45 minutes, but a couple Hold of Hold on, has it only been 15? No, we've oh. been on live for 45 minutes. <laughs> oh, has it been that long? 40, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so quickly, another one here that we have is in these text boxes, um, let's just say for scale, uh, we can do, like, we, you can actually do uh, your, your math operands. So, um, you know, multiplication, division, all that. Um, so, if I just go, like, five, where's my plus button? It's five, you know, and then we get you know, 10 for whatever the scale of that mm -hmm. object is on that. Um, that's one thing that's like, I don't think a lot of people 
always I, I always forget about it. I'm always like whipping out calculators and stuff. And yeah. And it's like I can just sit here and use these text boxes. Um, so, so last one I'm going to show for the level editing here is, let me go back to my perspective. And this is a workflow that I use very, very often. And I use multiple details panels. So um, up here in our windows, we actually have a, a bunch of different options for different panels that are maybe closed. The ones with check boxes beside them are already opened. The uh, one for details panel, you can have up to four detail, details panel. Okay. Um, same with uh, content browsers. Um, so right down here, you can have up to four of those. So the difference between, or, or with these, or not difference, but um, something that you can do with them. Let me scale this down. Is we have these little lock buttons that are all over the place um, for these kind of panels. So I've, I've seen people ask, you know, it's like, okay, you know, I'm working on something, but I'm constantly having to select off it and go and you know and try and move around the world and it's selecting whatever the other actor is. Um, these lock panel buttons, um, whatever I select. So let's just say the tree here, and I lock on it. I can click off it. Oh. And then I can I can keep the settings here because I, I I think I saw someone had posted on the forums or on the UE4 Facebook group uh, that's community run, um, you know they they had two details panels open but every time they selected it was it was selecting that asset for both of them, so this is this is uh, again one workflow um, same for the content browser, I actually didn't realize this one until recently the uh, content browser has the lock key so it's like I, whatever folder I'm in I can stay in that spot and and work from it, so. It's really handy when you're iterating between two things, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah, and I do that that very often in my workflows, just okay. for for uh, um, like right now. It's like uh, I'm working on the sky atmosphere documentation. So as I'm working on that, I'm constantly switching between the directional light and changing some settings and the uh, the sky atmosphere um, stuff. So you know, it's like it, it's one of those things. I just have those both those panels opened and I have them locked, and that way I can just keep both those settings there, and it just it, it makes things much quicker for me to turn around and adjust that way. Um, so let's see here. Let's open up a material real quick. Um, Lauren gave me a bunch of stuff uh, to call out on this. And um, she gave me a bunch of little things to, to call out because like man she she does like so many like quality of life improvements. She just joined in chat too. Yeah, yeah. she's so she's in chat and she's she's uh, you know participating in this like um, yeah, she, she does so many little quality of life things. Um, and this one is one that was integrated. Uh, someone from our community, um, Coconut Lizard. Um, and I'm going to call out his website real quick here, too. So, um, yeah, so he's actually got, like, documentation on this this uh, thing that he had added. Um, and it got got at integrated into the engine. So, you know, your, your features, like, man, if you, if you make something that's really useful, you know, for these things that can be broadly used, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, submit those pull requests. Like um, we we call you guys out, you know, here on the stream now, yeah. and, and and you know, and even in the release notes, we put your names at the top, you know, for for those kind of things. So um, yeah, definitely, uh, yeah, he's got some really kind of uh, cool stuff on here. So um, going into it, uh, I think there's probably a few things that aren't didn't get pulled over, but it's uh, but I mean, regardless, it looks kind of cool. So what this thing does, like when it's enabled here in the the um, material editor, is let's just say I select this alert node. Um, I can see the path of all of that going down, um, and I don't, and it just kind of grays out all this other stuff, so that way I can kind of keep myself focused on what that is, um, without all the other noise, um, and especially as your materials start to grow, or yeah. even in blueprints as things start to grow, um, you know, it's kind of the same thing over here. We got the, the option so enabled. Uh, Everything's in. related there. Yeah, I know. Like, so if we just do a branch, and. It looks so strange without the grid. I've never seen that before. <laughs> it's throwing you off. Yeah. It's like you're just lost in like deep space or something, right? Um, yeah, so yeah, so like right here, it's like I've got this node selected and it just shows me the path. So mm -hmm. same same kind of you know operation and everything. Um, the, uh, the one difference in the material editor that I noticed um, was that you can actually lock that node state as well, um, or you can just focus on the whole, ch whole chain. Um, so. Really, another kind of cool thing. Um, and while we're here on the material editor, this is another Lauren feature. The uh, um, so this one's got a couple of parameters in it. So you know, as your material graph grows, if you have like really large uh, list of parameters that are kind of scattered about, you know, you, you know, instead of having to go and constantly kind of search and find them, 
um, you do get all those uh, parameters listed over here um, and the parameter defaults, and you can actually change those uh, there. So that's all that have been exposed? Yeah, so this has been okay. converted into a parameter. Um, like if I were to convert this to a constant. It's done going. Uh, and then apply the changes. That should disappear from this panel. I say should. Did it? Or is it somewhere else too? Uh, but see, that's why I don't do things on the fly. Hmm. Well, <laughs> top. There's another top there, maybe. It's new to me, so. Yeah, yeah. That's so. Um, what she wanted me to show too is if I take that material, she added this one. Um, let me make a material instance out of it. And then I'm going to open up the material instance here. And we have those uh, um, parameters here for, for bottom and top. Um, Let's just say that I changed this one to not be its default. There's now an option in here for show only overridden parameters. Um, and what it's going to show is it, it got rid of all the other parameters that were listed there. Mm -hmm. And it only shows that one. Um, this is something that I, I do use very often as well, um, especially uh, um, so maybe not in the material instant editor that I use this, but um, we have this in other editors. Um, so for instance, like the details panel here with this eye icon that you click on, um, the show modified properties. Like I use that one often, especially if I, like with some of my lights, there's so many like different properties and settings there um, that can be changed. That's uh, when I start to do troubleshooting or I'm not sure why something looks incorrect, that's probably the first thing that I go to. Okay. Um, because it just shows me what's been changed with that, especially yeah. if I'm, I'm debugging whatever scene I'm looking at and trying to figure out why something is not looking correct. Um, if you screwed it up, that's what you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Was it me? <laughs> um, it, and I, I, I should say most of the stuff that I'm looking at is my own projects, like where I did it before. Yeah. And it's like I'm opening it, I'm like, oh, okay, I'll use this again. And it's just like, oh, why is this messed up? Yeah. Because I don't work with other people's projects. Um, okay, so let's see your parameters tab, material instead, showed that one, showed that one. All right. Um, so in this as well, let's uh, let me come over to Content Browser. Content Browser has some more stuff I can show. Okay, so um, in the Content Browser here, the bottom right, the, the view options. I have to tell people this one uh, occasionally. It's like I do try and reference it in Docs, like uh, wherever I can, just because uh, you know some of those things do come up, and it's like these these properties are just kind of you may not always see them. Um, so with all of our plugins and stuff, like we, we're starting to rely a little bit more on like uh, plugin content. Um, so, for instance, like uh, uh, with this upcoming release, some people have already tried it. The the Sun and Sky um, plugin. It's yeah. it's a content plugin, so it's really cool, right? Um, it actually and it's it's built off. Uh, there used to be the one. Uh, I think it's still there. This the Sun Positioner, which is you know it's all under the same plugin, but um, it. it like the steps to enable it was it was a plugin content, but you would never see that folder when you enabled the plugin. So we have these options here where you have to come in to show engine content. And then what this does is it adds some engine content folders below here. And it's just things that are in the editor. And then on top of that, you know, it's like we have the show plugin content. And what that gives us is the uh, the different plugins that are enabled. So um, so you can actually start to grab content from there and, and, mm -hmm. and, and see how something's working. So, um, like engine content, I tend to enable when I'm working because there's there's things in the editor that are in the engine that we include by default. Yeah. Like for instance, like I mean, I always have like a skeletal mesh in like a dummy project that I make, and it's like we always have that little orange, T like that the TTP. old orange. Yeah. yeah. Oh, is, what, he has a name. TTP character. I mean, that's what oh. it, uh, the oh, file, TTP. file name. I thought you called him Tiki. I, I think it's tutorial third person <laughs> underscore character. Yeah. I know. I swear. I, I TTP. Just, I, Tim. I, I I heard Tiki Pete. Okay. And I was like Tiki Pete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe like, we just named him, <laughs> although that has no relevance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. To the actual I, was like, I was like, man, he's partying all the time. <laughs> it's like, um, train of thought, totally lost. But uh, yeah, so um, if you if if you're wanting to also work with like your own developer content folders, um, you can have uh, your own like content folder that you have for just yourself. Um, you know, where it's like a, you may be working on something, you don't want to necessarily check it into your project uh, fully at that time. Um, also, a good thing to call out that if you modify something, one of the files in engine content, mm -hmm. 
that oh, is by yeah, default it is set to be ignored, right? So if uh, you make a change, yeah, it gives you it gives you some pretty hefty warnings yeah. of like, hey, you're affecting more things because this is a uh, you may be changing it in what you think is your project, but that is actually going back to the engine yeah. root folder. What I and what I usually do is that I call I make a co a folder that's called engine content copy, and if there's anything that I want to use from the engine uh, content, I will copy it and move yeah. it over to my folder and yeah. under project. You know what I do? I grab this right here and I just drag it from the modes panel directly in without having to go Boom. through that whole thing. I, I do like to know which folder I've copied yeah. content from, because I usually want to exclude that from my package builds. Yeah, so yeah. I generally don't tend to do that for well, Usually like these dummy mode. objects are all I'm working with when I'm just doing a little test stuff, so yeah. But but uh, the, the ones for our basic assets, it's like that was one thing. It's like once I discovered that, I didn't have to go sifting through folders. I can just do that, that move, copy, whatever. Nice. Don't do the move. You, I think you get like nasty that, warnings, there we go. like validation <laughs> failed, you know, whatever. It's like nope. Yeah, because some of that stuff is required for the yeah. editor. I mean, you'll Could find all the editor that. textures and everything else in there. If you've ever packaged oh. for Android, then you can uh, development build. You can see all the textures coming. All right. Out. So while we're here in the content browser, um, let me disable some of this so I can get rid of the clutter again. Um, the where is it? Show favorites. So if you have a larger project, um, or even just a project that's you know like this one, uh, not super large or whatever, but uh, let's just say you want to make some mark some assets or mark some folders favorites. Uh, what you can do is click Add to Favorites, and under your Favorites option here. So again, View Options. We can go to Show Favorites. Right click on whatever the folder is or the assets. Um, Victor, I think you jinxed me because my right click menu is. What did I do? It's all not working. Yeah, my right click menu is not working. Oh. For the assets. But, anyways, right click. <laughs> 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 um, right click. Uh, Remove from favorites if uh, if it's one that you have in there. Um, another wink we can do in here too. Uh, I've used this in the past for projects I've had just because I'm totally a color person. Um, I like these. Uh, I like being able to set a color for a folder because I can quickly reference. This is how mm -hmm. I do my Photoshop files. Um, yeah, so go to set color and then you can use from existing colors or quickly create your own new ones. So. Um, so for another filter thing that we do have, um, so we got the filter options up here. Um, and I think we've opened up several different assets. And we go down to other filters down here. And this is another one that Lauren, Lauren added recently, the recently opened. And then if I go back up to my, now that is going to be per folder, I think, um, that it's going to remember what assets I did open. But if I come back up here to my, my general content browser, or, or content folder, that's going to show every every folder in the hierarchy under it. Um, you can see that these are the several assets that I did open. Um, by default, there's like 20 that it remembers, but you can change that in the editor preferences. Let's see here. Um, what was that called? Um, number of assets. Yeah. So content browser, and then um, content content editors, content browser, and then number of assets to keep in uh, memory filter. A recently filter, um, you can change that to a, to a larger number or a lower number. So that's um, a possibility to have more of a favorite toggle almost, or sort yeah, of, yeah, yeah. right? Because you're iterating on maybe five to six different yeah, yeah. an asset. Yeah, that's really nice. So um, there are plenty of other useful features there, like show redirectors. Mm -hmm. um, one of the filters I like is show redirectors. Oh, oh, is that one? Yes. <laughs> so, okay, look at all the filters here, man. Y yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> it's just one of those that I've. Um, is it under the? Uh, I believe other uh, miscellaneous. Uh, actually, miscellaneous. yeah, it, it's it's in there. Yeah, I have to look at that because that's that's yeah redirector. Cool. Um, so speaking of redirectors, um, let's do this real quick. Uh, oh man, you killed my yeah my. Let me try closing that and let's see if reopening it gives it back to me. I was gonna show the reference viewer real quick. So I have totally lost my right mouse button. What is up with that? I wonder. I don't think it's a battery issue with the mouse. Mm -mm. Um, I want to restart the editor. Mm. Can we got oh. time? Okay. Yeah. All right. 
I'd rather it works for you. <laughs> we are on preview one. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is true. Cause uh, and then I need to wrap up real quick so you can show your your really cool. Oh, that'll thing. be quick. I know it'd be quick, but I can show that anytime, Tim. I'm here every week. <laughs> <laughs> Right, we, we do have quite a few questions as well. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Some um, quick someone's wondering how to change the UI scale size and keep it after restart. Even on 4K display, everything is huge. Um, I'm I'm not sure on the 4K not display because sure. I don't I don't have 4K monitors. Okay, I do, and I never, but I never adjust anything while I'm working with them. I guess it depends on the size of your mm -hmm. of your actual monitor. Yeah, I think I'm one of the few people that opted not to go with the 4K okay. monitors. I yeah. like my 2K, and I was just I was like, yeah, I don't I don't need to change my workflow. Don't take away my 2K. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let me see if I get my uh, content browser. Let's bring it back up. Hey, there, there we, we go. go. We got it, got it back. Um, OK, so if we go here and asset actions, I believe it was. No. Oh, reference reverse right here in the, the main <laughs> thing. So. Um, Depending on your assets and you know how large your project is, you know even for small ones or whatever. Um, so if we open up the reference viewer here, um, the material that I've opened, what this shows is like anything where it's actually being used elsewhere, um, and it's it's all in like a, a hierarchy kind of structure too. So it's like if I start, so this is the asset here in the middle that I've got. Um, I can actually go and click back through and. I can keep working my way back to see where it is being referenced. So that material instance went to a material. That material is here that is assigned to the static mesh that is in this level. But this is probably a very simple one just mm -hmm. because it's, you know, it's it, it's not a giant world where you're reusing a lot of assets between different things, but if it's used in multiple levels, what you'll see here is it's it's not just contained to just this level. You're also seeing other levels that it, it could be used in as well. So um, for for tracking down issues for, you know, especially if, if you get late in the project and you're trying to slim it down and you're trying to get rid of things, yeah. you know, that like, hey, like, hey, you know, we've been working on this project for like two years. I don't need like half these assets anymore and I want to just start getting rid of them, but you constantly get those reference redirects and, and you know, it's like, oh, this is referenced on this asset and all this stuff. And if that ever starts to give you issue, you can start to use this um, to track down some of those and kind of see where everything is, is being referenced. Um, another one. Let's do this real quick too. Let's select an actor in the world. Actually, let's select them in the disable my recently opened. Come down here to props. And then I'm just going to select several different props here. And then I'm going to right click. And then go to asset editor, or asset actions, and then I'm gonna go down here to bulk uh, edit via the property matrix. Um, so the property matrix is this thing where it contains a bunch of. Uh, let me rescale this a little bit. Um, it contains the assets that you've selected, um, and then uh, some other additional information. So it's like if I select on each one, on the right side over here, we have settings that are relevant to that one. Um, and these are going back to the base asset in this case. So um, these are original like import settings. If I ever want to change those, instead of opening up the static mesh editor mm -hmm. and then going through the details panel and finding those settings, I can do this as well. Um, show you where the, where the um, collision is set as, uh, some of your level details. You're not going to find every property setting in here. Um, like for instance, like you're not going to find materials in here, but you know, it's like you'll find some that are, are relevant to you. Um, and depends on the asset, what properties are available. Um, so, but the cool thing about it is too, is like if I select some of these, like you'll notice there's pins over here on the side. Let's just say I want light map resolution on those. Um, it'll, it'll show me the light map resolution for these static meshes and everything. Um, whether it's allow for, uh, things start to overlap, so you have to expand memory, memory uh, menus again, but you can start to see some of these things, and maybe a, a quicker way to edit things for you. And to um, give you an overview of all of and them, And to right? give you an overview. Yep. Um, there's also another way to get an overview, so since you said that, I'm going to go show this real quick. <laughs> see, this is why the it's taking longer than Th This is why it's taking yeah. longer, because like we can always just go into, like I was going to show it at some point anyway, but um, 
you know, I always plan these to go like, like oh man, I'll go really quick. Uh, but the if we go to window here and the statistics, I use this one all the time for static lighting builds. Okay. Um, it can be used for more than that. So it gives you the primitive stats. So any of the objects that I have in the world, um, like you'll notice there's a whole lot of things listed here. Um, and then these are, when I select them too, um, it's gonna, all right, don't know why it's opening up the content browser. A second ago it was highlighting the uh, world outliner. Perhaps maybe it's overlapping, or maybe. But there's, um, yeah. Anyways, on that, uh, there's there's a number of settings in here. So it's like the primitive stats. It, it, it'll show you any of the objects in the world. Um, the uh, light map uh, that it stored, the the triangle count that it has, like just a whole bunch of like information. Um, the way I use it for, um, if you're interested for st texture stats, you can kind of see those as well. The, the static lighting information, um, show these really quick. The, uh, the light build info is one. There's none here right now because we haven't built lighting on this okay. machine yet. You know, it's, it's a project that comes with built lighting. But what you would see here is what assets took the longest to build. Um, and it, like for people that are just like, oh, you know, I cranked up light map resolution, but man, it's just stuck on like 0% or whatever. Mm -hmm. and it's like, um, this is like the first thing that I come and check like whenever I'm doing those kind of things and something's getting hung because it's typically like one or two assets. Um, they have a lot of light interaction and they have a light, light, high light map resolution so it takes them longer to build and it's like that one or two or several assets that are holding up your build process okay. where everything else might finish. Um, but that's a good place to check. And then the static lighting uh, info. This is just more like high level for the asset itself so it shows you the resolution um, for the light maps that is set. Um, and then it uh, shows you some of the texture information for, for what that will be generated in the end um, and whatnot. So, and then what the asset is and where it, what level it's referenced in. Um, so in this case, the Blueprint Office one. But yeah. Um, Do you want to show your thing real quick? And sure. I can, yeah. I can give my voice a rest. And it <laughs> <laughs> I realize we didn't time this through entirely because I'm going to have to work on the one or the little sideways. But I oh, yeah, that. yeah. Um, so it came up when we were talking about the, the property matrix. And I remember that there was a time where I wanted to uh, um, apply a default material to a lot of different meshes inside mm -hmm. the editor. And a long time ago, that option used to exist in the property matrix. That is true. Um, it doesn't anymore because mm -hmm. it was considered like a dangerous operation. There was right. there, there was some, some caveat there. Um, and then with the release of editor utility widgets, I thought maybe it's possible to build an editor utility widget that can do this for me. And it totally is. Um, so let's go ahead and move everything around a little bit. Uh, so if you don't know what editor utility widgets are, they are a way for you to script uh, editor functionality using blueprints, uh, which can be really handy. And now I have no idea where your content browser went. Oh, it's closed. It is completely <laughs> closed. All right, well, let's go ahead and fix this. So once again, we go to Window, Content Browser. <laughs> content Browser 1. <laughs> and then I'm going to put it down here, because that actually works for me. All right. And I actually like to go View Options, and then I go List View. Oh, yeah. Because no, then no, no, no. this, yeah, I prefer this. I even, <laughs> oh, now we're editing all of this. Um, I like to put it down here or over there. It doesn't really matter. We'll keep it here for to stay consistent with what Tim's been doing. Um, I don't really need modes for this, so we can, we can just go ahead and do that. Um, let's go ahead and go to Content. Let's make a proper folder. Editor Utility Widgets, simple like that. Um, do we have any filters or anything? Nope, it's all. All right. Yeah. Um, so the first thing, I think, oh, all right, let's go through and, and do the basic first. So we right-click in the content browser. We go to Editor Utilities, and then Editor Utility Widget. Now, since for 4.23, we also have the Blueprint option, um, which if you were not familiar with the previous uh, concept of Blue Utilities, mm -hmm. this is essentially that, just better. And it yeah. ties into how you work with. So the widgets are for what you present in your user interface. And then the utility, the editor utility blueprint can contain data and knowledge about the scene, et cetera. Um, so it's a, it's a nice way to work with both of them. But for this use case, all we need is an editor utility widget. So we're going to make that. And let's call it a utility widget, apply materials. So I think I mentioned that what I want to do here mm -hmm. is to have the possibility to set the default material on a, any number of static meshes inside the content browser. Um, so that's easy. So we made this. Now, this is how if you made UMG, um, if you worked with UMG, it looks like this. You get a canvas panel, um, and you have the little little graph here where we edit. For editor utility widgets, you shouldn't really use the canvas mm -hmm. panel. 
you don't need it because you kind of want it to scale when you're moving the uh, editor utility widget around inside the viewport. Um, and so previously, you'd have to go here in here and you'd have to delete it. All right, that's, that's the first step. However, um, there's been a really new, nice new feature edit that Lauren just told me about. So I was going to go ahead and show that off. Um, I believe it's project settings. And then let's search for widget. Um, and it's called the widget designer. So let's, let's see. It's under editor widget designer. Yeah, it's yeah, just right here. Uh, under editor widget designer for team. And I, 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 I thought this was amazing. Use widget template selector. If you check this checkbox, and now let's go back and delete uh, the one that we made. And then let's go ahead and make a new one, Editor Utilities, Editor Utility Widget. We get this little See, that's awesome. selector here where we can pick um, the default that we want, uh, which is really neat. Um, and so we got all classes as well. Um, and so you can pick if you want the Canvas panel. I guess there's no option for none. Um, that's kind of what I was expecting, but it's OK. Um, but it's neat. Did it's a nice little feature. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I did see, so I was playing around with this just right before we went live, uh, but the default root widget, um, I'm not entirely sure how to work with it, so I'm not going to show mm -hmm. it off. But there seems to be other options, um, debug resolutions, a bunch of options there. Especially, I mean, if you're a UI designer and you do this over and over and over, that can be quite nice. Or if you sort of you don't want anyone on your team to use a canvas, mm -hmm. um, or you want any of the other ones to be default. All right, let's go ahead and F2 to name this properly. Apply materials, and this is this is pretty quick. Um, all we need in here, first off, delete that canvas panel. Uh, let's go ahead and grab a button, drop that in there, and as you can see, now it scales entirely too. Mm -hmm. So no matter how I move this around in the in the editor, it will look great. And then let's add text. To the button, we will name the text a little bit descriptive. It can be named that, but what it's going to say is apply <laughs> material. Simple like that. Let's compile that. Oh, and let's be real proper. Button, not 53, it's button apply material. All right. Let's head over to the graph. We are, oh, it's, it's, it's also, <laughs> no, I'm, lo I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it totally works. We don't need any of these. Um, so we can just go ahead and select. The, the button. And then down here under our in details panel, under our events, we have on click. So whenever we click this, uh, we're going to do a couple of things. The first thing we want is that we want to get um, get selected assets, which what it, this will do, and to showcase this, um, actually, I'll show, show it. What this function will do is that any assets that you have selected in the content browser, um, it knows which ones those are. So the function mm -hmm. will return. Uh, whichever ones you have right there. So we'll do a little for loop to iterate through these. And then for each of these, we want to cast to uh, static mesh and see if is this a static mesh. If it is, we're going to want to go ahead and add this to an array. And a nice way to make that array, this is sort of backwards of how you do it in code. You would declare the, the variable first. Um, here we can just add a function uh, and then promote the variable. So we'll call this selected static meshes. And the cast is just to make sure that like, we, we, we only want the static meshes mm -hmm. here, because they're the ones we want to operate on. If this fails, we're going to cast to uh, material interface. And this is actually something I had to talk to Lauren uh, about a little bit, because we I don't want the person I don't want to have two buttons, one for material and one for a material instance. Right. I want to be able to operate on both and not care which one it is. Um, and material interface is actually the parent class of material instances and mm -hmm. materials. You might think that the material um, instance inherits from the material, but that's not the case. It actually inherits from the material interface. And so that's why we want to cast. We want to know that we're talking to one of these. And so if we're not a static mesh, and, uh, and then we cast to a material interface. That's what it is. We want to select this as the material that we actually want to apply to mm -hmm. all of the static meshes that we have um, and so that it becomes the default. So we'll drag that out. We'll promote that to a variable. If it's true, we'll call this selected material. All right. And once, once this is done, we, don't, we only care about meshes. We care about the materials. Uh, once we're completed, we'll do another for loop on our selected assets. 
And now I guess you could, oh, we have unrelated nodes on, don't we? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can go ahead and just compile this to collapse to a function, apply materials to selected static meshes. Very descriptive, easy to know what it says. Um, what I probably would have would do here is to grab the selected assets and promote them to a local variable. Local selected assets. All right, we're almost done, and we can show how amazing this is. <laughs> I thought this this helped me a lot, so we can do that right there, and then down here we can clean it up a little. Local selected assets. All right, and then on them we simply want to uh, material. I don't want to cast. Uh, is it set material? I think it's set material. Set material. No. Apply. I guess I do have my notes, but that's that's boring. Uh, what am I trying to operate on here? That is set to object. Oh, we don't want to operate on the um, on the assets. We want to operate on the selected static meshes. <laughs> One step too far. That happens. All right, so now that we are actually referencing the correct data type, uh, we can go apply its set material. And we want to set that to our selected material. Get selected material. All right, and now if I didn't screw anything else up, we're going to go ahead and compile this. Um, the tricky thing that threw me off first when I started working with these is that, OK, so I have my my editor utility widget here. Mm -hmm. We open it up. We just get here. Like, how do I get it? You right click, and then ah, okay. you run it. And so now we get our own custom um, editor interface that we can put anywhere. Um, for something like this, I don't do it too often, mm -hmm. and so I usually hide it somewhere over here. Um, but let's go ahead and find some assets here. What do we got? We got meshes. All right. You don't need to use this project later, do you? Because I'm just no, 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 no. Okay, cool. I'm good. <laughs> um, and let's go ahead and do filter. So we can do material, and then let's also add static mesh. OK, and so now we should be able to find there are probably no materials inside meshes, but we can go mm -hmm. ahead and select. Do you select the yeah. next folder back up, the assets one? OK. Yeah. On the top one, then we get all of them. Perfect. Yeah. All right, so we have a little boulder. Um, let's unselect that for now. We'll get this one out. All right, so say if you have a a ton of meshes, and you want them all to have the same material. Instead of going in one by one, um, sort of setting the default here, what this little script does is that if we, oh, I don't even know which ones I dragged in now. This is uh, just this, this three right there. Uh, yeah. And then can I select all of them? No, Shift B doesn't. Oh, it does. OK, awesome. So what I did there was that I Control clicked all of them, and then Shift B will find whatever you have selected in the viewport inside the content browser. So I have all of them selected. We will show materials again. Are they going to stay selected if I click here? All right, doesn't really matter. And then we'll select a material, say this blue one here, whatever that is. Are they still selected? I don't know. Let's try. Apply material. No, I don't think they are. So let's do what I'm, because what I want essentially is to have all of them in the same folder uh, so that we can oh, select okay. them. Or, or not in the same folder, but at least. Would using a second work, uh, second uh, content browser work? Here. Uh, it would, but I can also just do this. Oh. It would be easy if I didn't have to sort of show it off that it actually does it in real time. <laughs> um, oh, Jesus. When I had all selected, OK, so these three, all right, we drag them out here. We'll make sure these are selected. We'll pick this wood floor material, and then we'll apply materials. And that will actually set the default for all of them, which saves a ton of time. <laughs> and so just a quick little walkthrough of um, the editor utility widgets and what kind of um, things that you can do with it. Mm -hmm. um, this was something that I thought of, and I wanted the functionality which wasn't in the editor, and it wasn't. So it just took me a couple of minutes to put <laughs> this together. Um, I believe you can do it with skeleton meshes as well. Mm -hmm. And you might want to be smart here and put in maybe a warning or something if you have something selected that isn't. Um, a static mesh, et cetera. Uh, now, it won't do any of the operations on it, so it's fine. Um, but it's always good to, to plan a little. Um, hmm. Now, I've been talking, I get a little bit, a little bit get, dry. We got time to show one more thing, and then? We do, oh. actually. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're not too bad. Are we not? Not okay. too bad with time. All right. OK, so this one took yeah, two minutes. But it's, uh, it's a 424 feature. 
Um, oh, this is this is the big one. This is the grand finale. Oh, this we, is, this we've is, had several questions about this one. So okay, this is grand finale on on showing stuff, and then we'll answer a couple of questions. Um, but uh, okay, so uh, Victor, as he is, so. Uh, pointed out he has messed up my editor workflow here. There you go. Like drastically. You did the same for me. Um, <laughs> so we have this really awesome kind of thing um, here now. So you can actually set up your own kind of layouts in the editor. Um, I, I tended to use this a lot. Uh, again, this is something that affects my workflow more than, than most other people because I tend to work out of a default editor workflow um, just uh, with, with the layout and everything just because of the way that I write documentation. Um, so being able to quickly go back to a default editor workflow um, is really beneficial for me. Uh, it gives me my content browser back in the right space. It gives me everything laid out back as if I had just installed the engine. Um, so again, if we go here to window, um, we have under layouts now, we have a couple of different options. So we have load layout where you can actually load um, uh, a default layout or load any of the other ones that we've saved and created, and we'll create one in just a second. Um, or we can choose to import a layout. Um, I, I was watching uh, something Grayson was doing the other day, and I took and I went and created his layout, which is totally fine for his workflow, but I cannot work that way. Um, <laughs> that is, uh, I, I, I don't know where everything is. So I, I call that one sequencer layout because he had some really kind of cool stuff he was showing. So this is, uh, this is something that you know, I, I followed him at like Unreal Academy, uh -huh. and I was so afraid of like messing up his workflow. Well, I was like checking the schedule and double checking to make sure it's like I wasn't gonna like affect his his browser layout because like once you you know defy, decide on that for the engine, you have to reset it up every time. You don't have to do that anymore. So I now have this imported layout that that Grayson uses um, here, and then uh, what you'll notice is that it doesn't say it. I've imported it, but it doesn't say it over here at all. So what I'm gonna need to do is even though it's there. I just need to save that layout, and it's going to go ahead and save it for my editor session that I've got here. So I'm going to replace that one. Um, and then when I come back to Window, and then come down here to Load Layout. Uh, did not save it. I got a little too ahead of myself, I think. Um, let me change something first. Let me drag that a little bit. Um, one other thing I will do differently than his is. Let's just say I want a floating window too, because it'll remember those. Um, I tend to have a content, a second content browser occasionally over on the side or a details panel that's floating. Um, and then I'll come back up here to save layout, and just call this Tim's layout. And then now here under load layout, you'll find that I've got Tim's layout here, and then the default one. So if I switch back and forth between the two. I can now do this without having to restart the editor or do anything. It looks really nice when you switch, so, too. I like that fade. So yeah. Um, and then I'm going to just do this, too. Slate, enable tooltips, kill that, because it's getting away. Um, but one of the other things we were talking about, too, is like, uh, let's just say if I wanted to give Victor my, my layout for something, um, or let's just say if Grayson came back on to do another sequencer yeah. stream and he wanted to. Um, didn't have a project set up and he was just going to do everything just like from scratch without having to have, you know spend that five minutes you know setting everything up. Um, we and can just if someone um, is doing a tutorial, mm -hmm. they can share the um, the layout, and yep. so you as a user can load a sim layout so that it's easier to follow along. Yes, um, you know that's uh, yeah that's that's definitely a possibility as well. So there's 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 the issue you can run into is like you know especially people having you know tutorials and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know they're doing different editor layouts. Um, it becomes hard, like when you have to reference, you know, let's just say our documentation where we're we're that's working true. off the default view because we assume, you know, that's what everyone's going to start with. Mm -hmm. um, but with this option, it's like you know we have to take into additional consideration. So it's like if there's a better sequencer workflow and we're showing that tutorial, yeah. it's easier to go, hey, you know, download this workflow and or this this layout and and import it. So um, when you go to save and export, the one cool thing about this is kind of a um, let's just say here I've got my details panel open. I'm gonna Set this for some defaults, um, whatever's, and then when I come to save, I'm going to choose export. And when I export this, I'm going to just call this one Victor's. I appreciate uh. you saving my layout, <laughs> Tim. <laughs> um, if 
Hold on, I didn't do it for details panel because that was an asset. Um, let me open up one of the static mesh editors real quick. Um, see, this is already messing with me because I was trying to find like, <laughs> an object. Um, all right, you know what? I'll show you why this thing is awesome. Uh, back to default layout. <laughs> now I can find things again. Um, uh, I did this, I triggered it earlier, but it, it can save settings for some of the settings too. So for, um, I don't know if it would work for these, but we'll try. Oh, it's so like import and. Yeah, let's okay. Just save that. I don't know if it's just going to do it on an asset one. Um, but the, I'm still learning this one. I, I'm not writing documentation for it, so I don't know this as well, but. Um, you just get to see a little bit of live me figure things out here for a second. Um, save, export, and then we'll call this one Victor's again. Yes. Yeah, here we go. So with this one, the preserve uh, UI layout name and description fields. Um, so what this one, what it's saying is essentially is like I've changed some of those default settings um, for things. Um, if I want to preserve those values when I send, let's just say I'm sending this, this layout to Victor. If I want to preserve those values for him, um, and he wants to take a look, I just would click preserve values. And then it would save all of that stuff into the INI file that he okay. goes to import. If I click clear values, all it's just going to save is just, it'll save the positions of where everything is, but it won't save those values, those edited values that I've added in. So um, just another option that you have there that's really uh, kind of interesting. Um, yeah. So that's, that's quite a bit. Yeah, that's, that's quite a bit. Yeah, good job. <laughs> Almost even failed the, <laughs> the knuckle there. All right, we got this. Uh, plenty of questions. Let's try to go through okay. them um, as quick as we can. Um, a few of them were about can we save the the, the layout or how mm -hmm. we how we have our edit. Um, yeah, I just encourage edit? everyone to just kind of play around with it because like there's I mean it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the remove layouts I didn't show this really, but you know if, like let's just say I never tried to remove the default and I'm not going to attempt to do that because I like the default. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, but you can. You know what? I don't like Tim's layout so. <laughs> Let's just get rid of that. And does that actually delete the, the file, or does it just remove it from the, the context menu? Let's All find right. out. Um, ask your question. I'll, I'll, I'll pull that up real quick. I can go to Show Explorer, and then I can open up my. All right. Uh, does the Unreal Viewport support 3D mice, for example, space mice? mouse? Um, not, not natively. Not natively. Someone made a plugin. I actually had yep. one of those, those 3D mice uh, a long time ago. Um, but I, I use it in 3ds Max actually quite a bit for, okay. for rotating and moving around the world. It's like it was very nice. Um, it looks like it did delete it uh, from my, my list. Okay, here, so. so be careful. So yeah, it's a pretty good thing we checked that. Um, so you you might know this one. How to select? This was uh, before when you were doing uh, showing off some some of the selection options. Mm -hmm. How to select in viewport object, but just selection mode without move like Q in the Maya. Oh, the lock it. No. Okay. There's, there's not an option for that. I know that's that's been a top requested feature for a long time. Um, I, I don't know what the plan is. Um, how to pie with the cinematic camera? You need to have the cine camera as part of your pawn, right? You're getting into uh, blueprint stuff. Okay, almost. okay. So I yeah. know that that's that's one way to do it. Um, yeah, essentially you'll have to replace the camera in whichever pawn you're possessing with the cinematic camera, and that way um, you'll be able to use the the cinematic camera. Um, I think I I might have done that for the the VR mm. one of the VR streams mm. I did. Um, can I snap object to position under mouse? Um, I'm gonna say I think so. There's th we have some snapping options. Um, I don't tend to work with the snapping. I think you can hold V as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in the docs, like we do have uh, some snapping options that are control commands. Um, or transform actors. Remember real quick. There's 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 some key commands that you can use, um, but we also have these settings up here under settings and then snapping. Um, that may work as well. I don't think it's a snap under mouse. Planar vertex, yeah. And then yeah. I think holding V. There are a couple options. Yeah, yeah. There, there are, there are yeah. a couple that aren't once as part of this to enable all the time. But there's. Um, I'm planning on putting my list of. Everything that we've kind of gone over, um, I'm going to clean it up and, and link to documentation um, on stuff that we have documentation for in this. And yeah. Because like I mean, these are these are little things; they don't always get their own page. 
Um, but you know, they're just kind of you know they may be like a tip or a tool tip or mm -hmm. something mentioned in the page somewhere. So and we'll make um, sure to um, put that up on the uh, forum announcement post. We'll have a link there. Yeah, yeah, and you'll probably tweet about um, it as well. And so yeah, I'll I'll, I'll find that because it's it's in one of the pages. Um, sorry, I can't find it right away. All right, uh, moving on. Is there a way to spawn the selected actor at mouse position? Um, let's say I want to spam out a lot of the same blueprint on the ground. I think El Hussein has mm. made or is working on a plugin for editor utility widgets that will allow you to do this. And so that's part of why why we're developing that because we you know people can make their own specific custom use cases of how they want to work with the editor. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and highlight his page Yeah, because so much of his stuff is great. Um, he's, he's got a lot of really kind of cool workflow and template mm -hmm. kind of like sample projects that he's, he's done. Um, highly recommend checking out his site. It's ue4resources.com. Um, I've talked to him on Twitter a number number of years now. <laughs> Dude is just like full of like knowledgeable just keep like, like making you know, amazing man, he, the, things. The stuff yeah. he makes is just like amazing. Like when he made this site, it's just like it's yeah. There's there's tons of stuff that he just keeps adding to it. It's just amazing. Um, but yeah. ue4resources.com, yeah, definitely. It's a great resource. Anyway, I've seen that he's working on a um, a, a plugin that allows you to have um, input at editor time f in the viewport. Mm. Um, I'm probably botching. He probably has a much better explanation <laughs> of what it can actually do. And so some of the things he was showing off, that combined with editor utility widgets, mm. he was able to just click to place oh, things inside, like the, real -time inside things. the scene. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so keep it following him on Twitter, and then yes. um, I'm sure he'll announce when, when that is released. Um, let's see. Any chance we can have a, um, a custom eni entity list? We have recently placed light cinematic. Um, would be nice to have custom categories to quickly access, organize our blueprint actors. Uh, favorites is what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Um, or just put them in the, the right folders. So yeah. Uh, like use the folder hierarchy to. to I mean, I mean, I guess the, you know, with that, I guess the description there is like that for me would be the favorites right mm -hmm. now. Um, so uh, view options, show favorites, and then you know if you're working with those, uh, you can add whatever the assets are. Did, did it break again? It did break again. Well, I guess we're going to go file a bug report when we're, um, yes. like when we're done with the stream. Um, will there be any stream for the new static mesh editor from, uh, from Isana Real? Yes, I would mm -hmm. love to do that. I would have to figure out who the best person would be to come on the stream There's for that. There's a new static mesh editor? Mm hmm Wow. Okay. Yeah, it's in. I don't know everything. It's in preview now. No, I'm actually <laughs> not sure how to. There's, there's, there's so, many, so many things. So many new there things. It's like, many, man, many, if, many, if many I could things. just invent time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it right now. Um, what would be the best? Best. Okay, uh, I like this question. What would be the best workflow advice you guys could ever give? I know what my my answer is, but I want to hear yours. Oh, I want to hear yours first. Source control. Oh yeah. 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 I was just gonna say this stream, but. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I mean, I mean, everyone has their own, you know, yeah. kind of workflow. It, that's, for me, that's a very, you know, objective kind of like, or, or subjective question. It's like it's it's hard to say because you know, I, I, throughout this stream, I've, I've told you what works well for me, and that's. That's what a lot of this is, is just kind of like some hidden things. But you know, when something does work for me very often, mm -hmm. um, you know, it just it depends on what I'm working on, and I can't narrow it down to just like one simple thing. But source control is a good one. That was sort um, of and depending on the project, you know, and size or whatever, it's like mm -hmm. like for me, Google Drive is a good backup like thing if I'm not using source control for just like simple little projects. But you know, it's just just depends on the person, I guess. Yeah, and what you like to yeah. do. Yeah, source control and scope out your work. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there's a lot of that. I've been thinking yeah. of doing one on sort of another stream where we we would bring on some veterans that have been you know production for many 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 years and what yeah, they've learned. So, um, I think I wiped it, but uh, you know even like just the difference between this and this layout that we have here and and Grayson's layout that that I've mocked up here. You know, that's a completely different workflow for the work that he does mm -hmm. constantly, you know, with the sequencer, you know, and, and the take recorder here. And just the way that he has all his panels laid out, that's a very specific workflow that's not going to necessarily work for everyone. It may not work for everyone that does that type of work, but it works for him, you know. So, um, you know, I, I think as the engine grows, we just start to add these features that are really kind of help you improve that workflow. And I think mm -hmm. Lauren does a really good job. You know, that, you know, she helped me with calling out some stuff earlier today. You know, there's just like things I wasn't aware of. That you know, just like the recent filters and just um, some of the uh, the material stuff um, for the the high nodes and stuff like that, um, 
you know, it just improves everyone's workflow. So, and that's um, and the, like, the longer like she you work. absolutely like loves doing that those those small little things that you know it's not not necessarily like this huge giant feature, but it improves your workflow. And it's like it's so small you may not notice, but when you do, those those little bit of seconds here and there are just yeah. amazing to get back. Straight in connections. Yep. Oh, it's so good. Yes, that one too. <laughs> um, um, let's see. Oh, we got plenty of questions. Let's see. Yeah, we have a little bit of time left. Um, how to save that folder color? If I move to another machine, it is lost, like locally saved. Oh, uh -huh. to another machine. OK, so that would be part of um, uh -huh. what we were showing off in project settings, right? How you can export your, oh, but that's specific to the project. So editor per project user settings, might that be the INI that you actually need to? Yeah, it's probably the per project. That, yes. That's probably a little bit more. Post that question on the forums and, okay. and let me let me get back to you. Okay. Because um, there are some things like where you can go through the INI files and and you'll you'll have there's there was like one thing that we, we debated on showing on here. It's just we're gonna run out of time, but it's um it's a blueprint kind of like hotkey kind of thing. That oh I well, you know what it could also be. Um, it could be that they're only grabbing they're not grabbing the intermediate folder because you usually shouldn't yeah. when you uh, or sorry saved. Uh, the uh, saved folder, because that's where those settings well, actually live. Speaking of that, let me show this real quick. <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead. No, keep showing another thing. Um, whenever you go to package up a project, um, if you don't want to grab stuff it doesn't necessarily need for that project, and um, like and that's the saved or the intermediate folder, um, it, it still grabs all your config, your content, and, and the the project file. But the zip up project is a really good one, like to send to people, um, because uh, the saved folder gens tends to have like the the saved derived data cache and intermediate. They can regenerate those. Um, but uh, this one, the, the saved, as it saves additional saves over time, mm -hmm. will start to really bloat. And yeah, the yeah auto so you can see some of them there, right? The auto saves, yeah. um, backups, and such. So, right, so this so. zip option will save, for example, if you have a color in the color palette, you've saved some favorite colors. Mm -hmm. That would bring them with the project as well? I, I would think so. Okay. Yeah. I, I would think that should, should bring everything, because um, those should be in the config folders. You're not seeing them because it's trying to save as a zip file. But, um, um, let's see. But if not, we can always do above above any of your stuff. You can always export and then re-import those. So, um, is there a function in the engine that shows you? I think what they're trying to ask is if that shows you unused assets. No, but there's a plugin. Is there a plugin? Yes, I've seen a plugin. I don't remember the name. That of one's it. been a highly requested thing too. Yes. Yeah. Um, there is a plugin. I will also follow up on the forum and mm -hmm. post that link. I know there is a plugin, or it was being worked on. But anyway, I'll bring <laughs> as much information as I have regarding that. I'll I'll put on the forums. Um, let's see. How would you package a editor utility widget for say uh, selling it on the marketplace, just as any other asset? I believe. Now I haven't done that. Yeah, um, not sure. And the process for submitting to the marketplace, um, I haven't done that either. But it is just a U asset like mm -hmm. anything else. And so compare it to like a uh, content pack on the marketplace, it's very similar. Um, you just make a bunch of assets that you can put together, and as long as they meet the style and standards. Correct, of, of the, marketplace. the marketplace. Yeah. So it um, would probably be as part of a, you know, it wouldn't be a plugin, it would be um, a content, yeah. right? Yeah, because it's an asset, right? Yeah. Um, so right click migrate. Wow. Ooh, uh, cool! F I almost forgot to mention this. I saw this on Twitter the other day. Um, I think someone wrote it in one of your threads. But if you want to migrate just a pr uh, couple of assets mm -hmm. to um, you know send to someone else on your team, uh, instead of making a new project to migrate to, mm -hmm. you can just make a folder that's called content, and you can yep. migrate to that folder. Right click. It was super handy. And I don't oh even yeah. remember where I read that. We were talking about it earlier as well. Oh, that's driving me bonkers. Yep. Well, anyways, I can I can I'm show sure you. You're I not can, alone. I, I <laughs> so mesh is here. This will be the same for any asset. Yeah. But, um, uh, same. Uh, was it edit options? Migrate. Oh, it's actually right there. Oh, is it migrate? Operations? Yeah. I yeah. keep wanting to look in like submenus. Um, migrate and then I'm just gonna say not save. And what it does is, so it gives me the game folder is essentially my content folder. The assets that I've grabbed are located under the materials. Um, so it shows all the materials that are referenced in that yeah. meshes folder. It also grabs the meshes folder. Um, you can pick and choose what you want. But the same thing we were showing with that reference viewer, if it's referenced in something and it needs it, um, it won't grab levels, but it'll uh, unless you specifically select them. But um, since I grabbed all the meshes or whatever, it's uh, 
it grabs all the materials and textures that go with them and then when I click OK I can choose where I save that as well so um, if I just choose desktop you don't have to call it game I just call it game it'll give you a warning that this is not in that uh, not in, in the correct structure but when you click yes or whatever it'll it'll go over okay I guess I'm a little I, I tend to all right it's complaining let me do yeah. it the proper way um. yeah so so whenever you do get that folder um, it'll give you just the assets folder and then it gives you those subfolders whenever you do it I, I've seen people do this a number of times but um, just drag this assets into your content folder or create the content folder like you said yeah and then just name you know because if you name it content and just drag it in it's just gonna be like done that just works mm -hmm. um, this is an interesting one, and I think I know the answer to. Um, is it possible to record a camera in real time? For example, using a joystick or so, and then they were clarifying the camera animation. Yes, if you use sequencer and you add uh, whichever actor that camera is a part of to be a recorded actor, um, I guess we are on the almost on the sequencer <laughs> yeah, sequence outline here. <laughs> um, so it, we would have to set up the actor with the camera, but it, but if you if you had an actor with that camera, uh, your, your pawn, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can control the pawn, you know, with a joystick. Um, and you select that actor to be a recorded actor in sequencer, and you hit record. You mm. move around. That will actually be a transform track in sequencer, mm. and you can use that transform track and apply it to other actors in sequencer, um, and uh, and and play it back. So if for a, a cinematic or something, mm. instead of hand keying um, or setting up spline points that it interpolates between, or however you want to do that that camera motion inside Unreal. Uh, you you could fly the camera uh, with the joystick. I I've been touching on different parts of how you'd be able to do yeah. that in a couple a couple of the streams I did, um, but it's pretty straightforward. If you just follow yeah. the sequencer documentation, you should be able to figure out cool. um, how to do that. Let's see. Um, is there a way to use a modifier to make the blueprint viewport move with a shortcut plus left mouse button instead of right clicking, as I use a graphic tablet and hovering all the time hurts. That's yeah. I'm not sure on that one. No, I don't think we have the option to change that in the keybinds um, feature request. because yeah, because I've actually I tried to use a graphic tablet for blueprints once. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of usability issues. I was realized quickly I had the same thing. I was just dragging my hand across. Yeah. Um, uh, oh wow, there's there's like eight more that came in as as we've been going through these. <laughs> um, oh okay. Um, is it possible to modify keybinds or make your own to make something like one key press for 90 degree actor rotation or one key press for swap actor with selected one from content browser? I'd say just use an editor utility widget or blueprint at this point. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty much it. And then yeah. you'll get a button. And I think with LSC's plugin later, you'll be able to assign a key a keybind to it. Uh, just just thinking. Um, yeah, that yeah. I, I think that's the way to go. That, that would be the right. Like I know Mitchell has created some stuff like that, like where it's just like buttons um, for rotation and stuff. Like when he was doing uh, some of his release note work on it before. So what I would do is uh, change the snapping to ninety, and then mm -hmm. I just move it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that too. <laughs> huh? But yeah, that too. But I mean, for for you level editors, they're gonna be well. Doing the same yeah, maybe thing. Yeah, it's yeah. forty-eight degrees, right? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Or but um, whatever you want. Um, can we have a global asset manager like the one in Twin Motion? Um, I have only played around a little bit with Twin Motion, yeah, not, here. not worked with it in a production project, so I don't know. Um, um, that that's it. See if there were some um, a Python UI in the plans. It's not as far mm. as I know. I'm not sure. Um, Regarding the game viewport settings, mm -hmm. is there a way to add custom presets? I'm I'm not sure. I don't think so. I wonder if they mean sort of like what you have, yeah, what yeah, you're yeah. Like, like what's what's there. Yeah. Um. If so, I'm not sure. Oh. I've not looked through any INI files to see if that is just set somewhere. Um. For those differences. Maybe but for all those default things, it all 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 of these options are part of INI files. So yeah. 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 It's probably buried in there somewhere. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Uh, somewhere. Um. Um, those are all the questions I believe that we can answer now. We're also a um, little bit over time. Yes. Um, Tim, thanks for spending <laughs> an hour and 45 minutes with me here and going oh, through all been these that long. things. <laughs> it has been that long, yes. It's almost, it's almost 4 <laughs> o'clock here on the East Coast. Yeah. Um, but that was fun. I hope um, 
uh, for all of you who are still actually wa watching the stream <laughs> at this point, um, learned learned a couple of things and, yeah. and had a good time. Um, as always, we uh, we have a survey that I think Amanda linked like half an hour ago <laughs> or maybe 15 minutes. Um, let us know how we did, what topics you would like to see in the future on the stream. Um, I try to invite uh, as many people as possible to come here and talk about their area of expertise. Yeah. Um, and if there's, there might be something that I haven't thought of, um, especially coming up for next year. Um, yeah. I have some really cool things planned um, for this year and then also next year. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, it's just exciting that, that the guy's got some awesome ideas. <laughs> and so do you, which is why you're here with me on yeah. the stream uh, and you're showing off things. Yeah, you taught me probably like 10, 10 12 different things today. Okay, so out of my I 120 options that I showed you, it's like you know, 10 of those were good. All right, I'll take I it. I didn't say they're all good, but I'll take I have, I have, <laughs> I have quite a bit of experience with the editor, and so I have touched on some of these things <laughs> myself. Um, now all of it is great. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, especially if you don't know it. Exactly. Uh, then it's even better. I was going to say something else there. I'm, I'm getting a little. It, it's getting a long, becoming a long stream. <laughs> um, right. My my typical outro here that I. I should, should go through. Um, we'd love to see more countdown videos. Um, we haven't received any in a while. I I'd love to surface uh, some of your guys' projects. Take 30 minutes of development in the editor, fast forward it up to five minutes, send that together with uh, your logo separately, and we might feature you as one of the countdown videos for the stream. Um, it's kind of fun, and we like to sit and watch them as, as it's counting down, you know, <laughs> I mean, getting a little bit, bit of butterflies before the stream, and it's a good way to um, take your mind off of, uh, off of what's going on. Absolutely. Which, uh, we should be focused still. So, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, make sure if you're streaming on Twitch, use the Unreal Engine category. Follow us on social media, and make sure you hit up any local user groups if there are any in your area. Uh, if there aren't none, and you are interested in perhaps um, organizing one, know some people in there that are interested. Shoot an email to community at unrealengine.com, and we will tell you all about uh, what it is being a meetup organizer, nice. user group organizer, meetup organizer. Some cool things coming there too uh, soon in the future. Uh, follow us on social media and thanks again, Tim, for taking the time to preparing the presentation. Yeah. Thanks, Lauren, for um, filling in on some of the details that we were <laughs> unaware of uh, before the stream, and to everyone else who's making amazing things with the with the editor and the Absolutely. engine. Absolutely. Right. And then next week we are kicking off the Mega Jam, yeah. which is very exciting. <laughs> a full week of um, hopefully a lot of you all making amazing games and projects that we'll get to play. Uh, yes. So it's really exciting. Uh, if you haven't seen it, check out the list of sponsors and prices. We have some very nice contributions from our sponsor this time around. Mm. Um, a PC from Falcon Northwest with <laughs> cats on it. Um, very exciting. I think those graphics are about to go up now. So <laughs> Sp spoiler alert. Um, super cool. And um, and then running up uh, the schedule on Twitch for what we're doing um, exists on on our Twitch page. I don't think I've updated it yet for the next couple of weeks, uh, but that will come t later today. So if you're ever wondering what's coming in the future, um, just go ahead and go to the channel, our channel on Twitch, and you can see it right down there. Uh, awesome. And for that, I think we're done for today. So thanks Sweet. again, Tim. Yep. Awesome. I'll probably have you on sooner than you think. I know. Yeah, <laughs> there's always new things coming to the engine, and we haven't even started well, to cover well, I'll, I'll go all ahead the and new for I'll, I'll already features. go ahead and tease it. You know, it's like we've done this for the last two releases. We've done an editor smaller features yeah. stream, so I'll be back and we'll do another one of those. Yeah, so. I really want to see the, uh, the atmospheric um, oh, the, sky the, changes. Yeah, that's a, that's a top 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 feature. It is. So. Yeah, it's really neat. I actually so, yeah. saw Ryan Brooks at Unreal Dev Days go go through it, and it's like. You heard that, oh, in the audience. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, it's really cool. So be excited, and we will see you all next week. Have a good uh, rest of your week and the weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.